Uh, before I start, apologies in advance if my enunciation isn't great. I've made the annual mistake of recording with a canker sore, so on the chance that it sounds like I'm saying her pronouns wrong, that will not be intentional, just putting that out there. Hello everybody, welcome to The Wonky Angle, where I talk about electronic music, both new and old. And today I'm talking about the four new albums from ARCA, Kick 2, Kick 3, Kick 4, and Kick 5. Man, oh, jeez, four new ARCA albums. Is it bad that I wasn't really looking forward to this? I have gone over my thoughts on Ark in the past. I've already reviewed her self-titled album and Kick One. I've linked both videos in the description. But long story short, uh, she is definitely an artist to whom I have a lot more respect for than get actual enjoyment out of listening to her music. She will always have that one album I loved, her debut in 2013, Zen which took her abrasive experimental style and filtered it through some abstract, ambient compositions that created one very unique but still absolutely alluring alien atmosphere. Still think that album is excellent to this day. And I could probably get behind Mutant as well now, even if I haven't listened to it in years. But most of her stuff after that, while I could always at least appreciate for how out of the box and unique it all was and fully understand how it could resonate so deeply with other people, on a personal level, I wouldn't be pulled in nearly as much as I'd want to. And her more recent turn towards including her own vocals hasn't really been my thing either. Her self-titled album had its moments, but her near operatic delivery there was just kind of a personal turnoff. Just never been big on that particular kind of vocal delivery to begin with. And then Kick One showed her basically combining some of the ideas on that album with the ethos and a lot more of the abrasive mix of experimental and pop aesthetics as seen on Sophie's Product and Oil of Every Pearl's Uninsides as if she was just trying to become the Spanish-speaking equivalent to Sophie. And that was all well and good, especially since we unfortunately no longer have Sophie around to give us more material in that vein. And having uh, more popular artists like her around to explore these ideas of transgender and non-binary identity in a more mainstream adjacent space is only a good thing. But Kick One just left me even more detached than Arca's previous albums. The Sophie worship kind of made it feel less original than any of her other stuff, and possibly harder for me personally to swallow given how Sophie's particular style is never been that much my taste to begin with. Outside of a few isolated moments which seem to throw back to ideas she'd explored on earlier albums, the whole thing could be a bit of an exhausting listen from how intense and abrasive it could get, and how badly it wanted you to know that she doesn't give a fuck about what anyone thinks about her. I didn't dislike it, I got why it works a lot more for other people, and it was actually a little better than I remembered coming back to it for this video, but I would not say it was really my thing. So all that is why when I saw that she announced three more albums as direct follow-ups to that album to all to be dropped immediately one after another, along with the surprise fifth volume which came out the day after the fourth dropped, I had war flashbacks the day I first found out uh, Outerker's Elsec existed. <laughs> Even if I really like Elsec, and this entire series is still shorter than that album. This still looked like it was going to be one hell of a commitment, and if Kick One was supposed to be a taster for what I was going to get for everything else here, oh dear god, I was not mentally prepared for this. So that's kind of why I've been dragging my feet on this video. That and the canker sore. Uh, but <laughs> despite everything, perhaps against my better judgment and in hopes of getting more traffic, I suppose, I still pulled through and made the commitment of digesting all four of these albums. Um, I guess I liked some of these. I think which parts I liked or didn't like in that first volume were also indicative of which parts I liked or didn't like in all the others. A lot of my thoughts on Kick One are perhaps unsurprisingly going to echo through a lot of the rest of the series as well. Also, I hope you really love pitch shifted vocals, because outside of Kick Five, you will barely find a passing moment throughout any of these albums where they aren't present. I do get why she uses that uh, effect so much as a way to make her voice sound more feminine, but also kind of more alien and less human. It does fit well with her expression of gender identity and the themes explored on all of these albums. But she does still typically use this effect in a really garish and intense way that I guess meant to put people off and tends to be a turn off more often than not. To say this all feels like a bit much would be the understatement of the freaking century. <laughs> I do have to give her credit for getting all of these projects to have their own unique feel to them to set themselves apart from each other while still thematically supporting each other and all collectively forming one mega arc surrounding her own personal experience with uh, gender identity and uh, transitioning. You can tell that she developed them in parallel the same way that Amon Tobin's been doing with his most recent stuff. 
As per usual, I will fully understand all of the people who found all of this to be so much more of a transcendent experience than I did. That baseline level of, I get the appeal, will carry through all four projects. But just like the vast majority of Arca's other work, I always feel like I'm often just kind of appreciating all of it from a distance, and it's not common for her to deliver something that actually viscerally uh, resonates with me. So I guess I'll talk about the albums in order. Kick 2's Buzz billed it as being the most direct continuation of what she did on Kick 1. And, uh, I guess technically yes, though this is a pretty different beast already. I guess this volume would qualify as her most accessible to date. A lot of this volume focused on con combining her typical style with fairly standard reggaeton formulas. Uh, Cake One did have that track with Rosalia, uh, KLK, that, uh, explored the same idea, but the entire first half of this album is cuts that follow in that track's footsteps. Now, I already wasn't huge on KLK as I felt the reggaeton beats kinda watered down Arca's style, made it feel less interesting to me. But that goes double for the entire first half of this album, which feels even less subversive and I was even less enthused by. You look at cuts like Prada and Rakata, aside from the vocal filtering and the fact that the instrumental is built out of sharp electronic textures and some trance leads, this isn't really that far a cry from reggaeton cuts you'd hear on the radio. They're exactly what I would have expected Arca's take on this style would sound like and just had me like, really? This, this is your subversive, futuristic, experimental take on this genre? I mean, they're nothing offensive or inauthentic. Uh, I guess this stuff does kind of get my foot tapping, and aside from her mildly annoying yelpy delivery on Rakata, and uh, the lyrics of Lethargy, which seem to be directly about going over tempo beats, just had me rolling my eyes. It's all at least listenable outside of that. I also have to give credit to uh, the track Luna Yena. Uh, that, that one actually pulled me in a lot more than these other similar cuts, with his much stronger brooding atmosphere. I quite like that cut, but everything else in the first half of this album left me thoroughly uninterested and underwhelmed. It's just a more skeletal take on these typical radio formulas, combined with the least offensive textures I've heard Arca explore before. And I just don't really get what people find so exciting about it. If I didn't know any better, I'd think some of this was a label concession, even if I seriously doubt it actually was one, because I can't imagine what label would be dumb enough to ask Arca, of all people, to make pop music. I don't doubt that this is the music she wanted to make, but it does kind of feel oddly watered down compared to what I would typically expect out of her. Of course, then the second half of the album starts with Aranya, and... Well, if nothing else, that track definitely resolved my issue with the previous cuts feeling dull or watered down. Aranya is the most fucked up, off-the-wall experimental cut I've heard her make since Mutant, and probably the most experimental cut in this entire series as a whole. And while I'm not gonna act like it was a pleasant experience, I mean, weird experimental shit like this is exactly why I have as much respect for Arta as I do. There's barely any coherent rhythm, all these squealing synths and crashing percussion fly around in dissonant heaps, it keeps shifting around through a bunch of different sections that focus on different blaring textures, and yeah, it's all intentionally ugly sounding and off-putting, probably not the kind of thing I ever see myself seeking out on my own time, but no one will be able to say it wasn't interesting. <laughs> the rest of the album, while not as far out there as that track, does tend to focus more on abstract leaning cuts, which, again, are a mixed bag for me, but at least didn't leave me as tuned out as the first half of this album did. I'm not huge on Femme or Munecas, uh, but uh, they do explore some, inter some more interesting ideas, like how the former has a lot of bassy rumbling that has OG dubstep vibes going over an almost trap beat. That does feel more like an experimental deconstruction of pop formulas than some of the stuff in the first half did. Or how the latter creates some pretty intense harrowing effect out of all its negative space, despite all the repetitive vocal manipulations that I found less than appealing. But the last three tracks are all pretty solid. Uh, Confianza brought in Clark as a co-producer, which I might not have noticed if you hadn't told me, since they do actually explore pretty similar textures. But uh, their styles unsurprisingly complement each other quite well, and her yelping vocals going over some fairly pretty keyboard work was nice. I like that one. I was not looking forward to Born Yesterday with Sia. Never been much of a big Sia fan outside of Zero Seven's Destiny, and especially after I've heard about that freaking autism movie she made, I would not cry if I never saw Sia featured on anything ever again. 
but her appearance on this album is a legit breath of fresh air. She does fit surprisingly well over Arca's weirder instrumental instincts, and that track does have a really solid hook. This collab did go over a lot better than I expected. And Andro is a pretty solid instrumental cut to close us out. Nice mix of stabby lead melodic synths that create a metallic and robotic sort of atmosphere, I guess. I mean, this album definitely has its moments, and none of it is unlistenable or anything. But it is really scattershot and incohesive with only a few individual moments that resonated with me. I guess it was fine. Probably got equal enjoyment here as I did out of the first volume and may have had slightly higher high points. But I did feel like the first volume was a lot more consistent and came together as a whole a lot better. So I'll, I guess I'll give a Kick 2 a 6.3 out of 10. Next up we got Kick 3, which seems to have been running away as the biggest fan favorite of this entire series. It's certainly by far the most abrasive, noisy, and banger-heavy out of all these projects, doubling down on moments like Make It Trefe, Rikiki, and the uh, Sophie collab from Kick 1, and creating a hyper, intense, glitchy, experimental hip-hop record. The final effect is like the most percussive material from Sophie and Dorian Electra by way of death grips and clipping or something like that. You know, the kind of stuff that was 100% guaranteed to appeal to Anthony Fantano. Now, of course, if you're talking about my own personal enjoyment, Kick 3 was by far the volume in this series I had the least fun with. And if you're surprised by that, you must be new here. This particular cell has never remotely been my thing or the kind of thing I really have much space in my life for. I'm neither a Death Grips fan, a Hyper Pop fan, or even really a Deconstructed Club fan, given my take on artists like Flume. I was pretty much guaranteed to not get into it just based off of those comparison points I've given. And while I can respect what it does even more so than Kick 1 or 2, and obviously understand why this is the one everyone's latched onto, actually listening to this was actively a chore to get through. I was completely checked out from beginning to end, and it was nothing but a gigantic, tedious headache for me every single time I put it on. The album was only 35 minutes, but it felt longer than that. I'm, I'm kind of at a loss for words on what I'm even supposed to say, breaking this thing down from an individual track level. There is enough sonic variety across the project for me to not end up uh, mistaking tracks for each other, but the vast majority of it falls under different permutations of the same mix of brutally crashing percussion, intense bass, and Arca's own vocals, which range from hyperspeed rapping in Spanish, to screaming and yelling, to whatever the fuck she's doing on Morbo and My 2, all the while pitching her voice up a lot. It's thoroughly unrelenting in its hyperactive firepower and obliterating intensity, and again, while I can absolutely see why most people found the non-stop energy to be so exciting, for me it just got tiring instead. At first I can kinda sorta of get into it with the crashing and banging beats and intense performances of tracks like Bruja and Incendio, but the vocal manipulations only get more and more extreme and more and more of a turnoff. The beats keep beating me over the head and the sound got stale. I wanted to like Fiera since I believe that's the only straight instrumental cut on here. But between how oily and unpleasant the synths are and how clattering and grooveless the percussion is and how repetitive the actual composition is, it just becomes tedious and makes this sound wear out on me instead. I wanted to like Ripples or Senorita. Uh, the latter had me kind of excited because of the Machine Drum co-production credits, and the former just happens to have one of the catchier hooks here. But by that point in the album, all of it is just kind of run together, and none of it grabs my attention as much as it's trying to. And that's not even getting into cuts like Skull Queen, which are just a lot more openly unpleasant in their vocal pitching than the majority of this stuff. This album was in desperate need of a breather, anything to break up the overall sound of the project, but the only thing remotely resembling a breather would be the last two tracks, Intimate Flesh and uh, Hoya, which go for a more uh, melodic approach than anything else here. The Closer is in fact a welcome breath of fresh air after all the insanity this album has gone through, a relatively peaceful moment that does combine a bit of the abrasive beatwork toned down to a slightly lower level I can much more easily handle with some more of the plucky acoustic experimental ambience I've always liked from her. But at that point it almost kind of feels like too little too late for me. I'm sure I'll be getting comments from people who are gonna be like, oh it's so experimental and challenging and deep that you just don't get it. And that's really not it at all. I immediately got it on first listen. I get the appeal of this more than I get the appeal of some of those plain sounding reggaeton cuts in Kick 2. 
I'll stop shitting on those. It's really not like this is unlike anything I've ever heard before. It's a mix of deconstructed club, hyperpop, experimental hip-hop, and whatever else. I've seen it explored by lots of different artists, and this isn't exactly the most novel or out-of-the-box twist on these genres I've ever heard. It's not even really that weird or abstract outside of the vocal manipulation. There are other moments on all these other albums that get weirder than the stuff on here. I really wouldn't have minded a few cuts like Aranya that actually did get a lot freakier and more abstract like that. The vast majority of this thing is just hip-hop bangers. Again, it's got a lot of the same kind of appeal as something like a Death Grips album, albeit explored from a different angle, being built out of elements from stuff like Sophie's Pony Boy and related material. And if that's your aesthetic of choice, then you'll love it, but it's not mine. And if you want me to force myself to enjoy it, I mean, I tried, but I just couldn't at all. It's frankly everything I feared this entire series would be when I saw it announced and leaves me feeling completely detached with pretty much nothing to grab onto and the sinking feeling that I'm just asking to get abused by even trying to touch it. I've already seen people hailing this volume alone as one of the greatest electronic albums of all time, because of course. And Arca has made it abundantly clear that she doesn't give a fuck about what people like me think of her, so obviously feel free to take me with a grain of salt as well. But no matter how much I try, I just can't with this one. I'm feeling like a 5.5 out of 10 on it, and I'm being generous there. So now that I've thrown all my crit out the window with that take, let's move on to Kick 4. This one's audience reaction, in direct contrast to Kick 3, seems to be getting a much more lukewarm response. All the buzz I've heard seems to mark this one is the weakest volume of all of them. But ironically, this was also the first volume where Arca genuinely started to pull me in and even recapture some of that initial excitement I felt when I first uh, really got into Zen. Formless and Serene are two words I've seen thrown around a lot in relation to this volume, and those could definitely apply. But this also feels like the point in the series where she really started to get more emotionally vulnerable as well. This volume feels like it means something special to Arca herself, and I do think a lot more pathos was carried across here than any of the previous Kick volumes. I still wouldn't say I love this one. I do personally view it as a bit of a mixed bag with some of my favorite cuts in the series, one of my least favorite cuts in the whole series, and some other stuff I'm more ambivalent on. But on average, I do think I got more into this volume than any of the previous ones. I may as well quickly get that least favorite moment out of the way first. I absolutely could not stand Iha. The way her voice is pitched up so unnaturally high and is placed so nakedly in the mix with nothing else to focus on when she tries hitting some really high notes. Jesus Christ, it was painful. Nothing else on the album touches that level of cringe though, thankfully. There's still a lot of pitch shifted vocals all over this thing, but they oddly, outside of that one moment, they oddly didn't bother me as much here. I guess a track like Queer didn't exactly blow me away with its fairly standard trap beat and how intense the pitch shifting can get, but I don't know, the way the vocals are modulated to sound like some kind of Middle Eastern horn is a pretty neat effect. And the big booming leads in the background do create some pretty neat atmosphere. That track did grow on me a decent bit with repeat listens. I like it. I guess the pitch shifting on Altar wasn't to my taste and how it pitches her voice up so far. It doesn't even sound like a voice anymore even if the notes actually being hit aren't nearly as gratingly high as those on Iha. Horror Song wasn't a massively attention-grabbing intro either, and its lower-key spoken word excursions were done in a similar way, but more creatively and musically on the track Witch, which I thought was cool, if also not a major favorite. Also, Alien Inside feels like kind of an odd one-off interlude that can feel a tad out of place with Shirley Manson's spoken word going over a pad of electric guitars. But I don't mind any of these cuts, and the best moments on here are especially solid. Isuna grabbed me immediately with how Oliver Coates' strings were worked into the mix and really gave the ambience some richer texture. And Xenomorph Girl was similarly well textured and very pretty sounding without any outside help from guest features. Fittingly remind me of some of the prettier moments on Zen and her filtered vocals on both of these tracks were worked in really nicely. I've not seen a lot of enthusiasm for Boki Floha, but this uh, was also a favorite of mine. Just a lower key electric guitar ballad where Arca explores a much deeper register of her voice than pretty much any other track in the entire series. And it sounds oddly comfortable and laid back and just really nice. I don't know. And the album ends in a really nice way too, with Lost Woman Found acting as a big triumphant moment where she expresses her joy at feeling some level of comfort in her own body post-transition. 
and the blaring leads once again feeling uh, taken out of her earlier work uh, feel really huge and imposing to match. And then the reverberating synth strings of Paw, I suppose made for a neat epilogue of sorts that I also thought sounded particularly cool with how big and dramatic it could occasionally sound. Cake form may not be the most consistent quality-wise, but I really don't see where the underwhelmed buzz for this one is coming from. In spite of the occasional moment where the pitch shifting could get to be a bit much, as usual, I really appreciate how it does feel like this really personal and vulnerable moment for her, and how after all the violence and insanity explored on the first three volumes, there's really a sense of relief coming out of this one, both through my own feelings of, oh finally she's going back to the material that actually made me a fan, but also through her own vocal performances, which again, feel much more emotionally charged than any of the hyperspeed rapping she was doing elsewhere. I'm not sure if I consistently like it enough to be a definite keeper, but I got quite a bit more out of it than I was expecting to based on its surrounding buzz. I can give it a 7.3 out of 10. But that finally takes us to the final volume in the series, Kick 5. Thematically, the point at which she is ascended into her final form, as it were, and officially feels comfortable in her own body and self-assured in who she is. But instrumentally, the most understated out of all these projects by far. Focusing a lot more on minimal piano compositions and much more spare and strips back ambient arrangements, with far less of her own vocals. And it may not surprise you to hear that this was the only one of these volumes that I properly enjoyed from start to finish. I mean, maybe with the exception of that obnoxious ASMR intro in the face, which I skipped over on all listens aside from my first. And as per usual, I wasn't crazy about the pitch shifted vocals on Chiquito, but even in the case of the latter, it's still far from the most grating example of that effect being applied throughout the series, and it's mercifully the only cut on this volume to actually do that. There's even two tracks here that show her returning to the semi-operatic singing style she had on her self-titled album with Tierno and Musculos. And even if neither are major favorites, I got into these cuts more than a lot of the similar cuts on her self-titled. Purely because she sounds a lot happier and more comfortable with the way she's presenting herself here. Between those two, I definitely preferred Musculos, since uh, I thought the icy pianos on that one sounded particularly neat. Oh yeah, and she even got Ryuichi Sakamoto, of all people, to do some spoken word bits on the track Sanctuary, which also wasn't a favorite moment here, but that, that is a pretty damn big cosine. But the majority of this album is being taken up by instrumental compositions, either just solo piano or occasionally some synth textures that resemble keyboards, and I really liked all of these. I mean, I wouldn't say they're so immersive or alluring to replace the likes of, say, Rum Pistols After the Flood, uh, but they still pulled me in pretty consistently, the minimal plinky bells of Poo, the warmer guitar-like textures of Estrogen, the chilling pianos of Ether, the building IDM synth progressions of Amrep that kind of start out chill and spacey and slowly get enveloped by distortion, all really freaking solid. And the way this project ends with its last three tracks is even better, La Infinita, despite also mostly being a solo piano composition with a bit of a warbling synth accompaniment, sounds a lot bigger and more expansive than any of the previous cuts. Uh, Fire Prayer has lots of formless plucking synths that sound like they could be Arca's equivalent to what Amon Tobin was doing on Fear and a Handful of Dust, al albeit much more full sounding and imposing. Also taking a break in the middle for a semi-poppy piano progression, which was oddly more satisfying than the rest of the track around it. Love both of these cuts. And then there's the final track, Crown, which I've seen some people complain about how out of place this track feels on this particular album. It feels like a cut that would have been pulled from one of the first three kick volumes with its much thicker and more violent percussion and her semi-wrapped vocal delivery from those projects returning. But I also kind of like how this cut feels like she's bringing the entire kick series as a complete whole full circle. And the icier piano textures she integrates into the mix do make it feel more at home in this particular album and help, me pull, and help pull me in much more effectively than a lot of the similar material on those previous volumes did. Really solid ending to both this album and this whole series if you ask me. I mean, it's true that this album does derive a decent amount of its power from my having digested the other kick volumes and seeing how everything led up to this point, and I'm not sure if this is the kind of thing I'm going to be coming back to a lot on its own as a result of that, but it is unquestionably my favorite volume in the series by a fairly significant margin, and I can give it a 7.7 .7 out of 10. And that's the whole Kick series. I don't think this series of albums is an easy one to recommend to those outside of her diehard fan base. It is a very big commitment and kind of requires you to be invested in her own story of gender transition and personal identity. 
I personally didn't feel like I was getting a fulfilling experience until the last two volumes, and I wouldn't say she's doing anything here that's really unlike anything I've ever heard, either from her older work or from her peers in this genre. But assuming you know exactly what you'd be getting and her style explored on Kick 1 uh, was really your thing, then by all means, check this stuff out. It'll probably be worth the effort. If nothing else, she did prove how versatile an artist she can be and got all these albums to feel like they could stand on their own as distinct pieces while reinforcing each other somewhat, and I did generally come out on the other end entertained despite everything, so... I guess take that all as you will. I think I'm gonna leave it at that. Uh, but of course, this is just my opinion. You can feel free to disagree with it, but I'd like to hear your thoughts, so leave the comments in the comment thing down there. Uh, shout out to my Patreon supporters. They're awesome people. You want to add yourself to that list. Uh, link to my Patreon is in the description. But yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all for today. See you next time.